So let's start. Last time we we stopped basically on, on this slide, correct me if I'm wrong. We, we reached the point where we discussed basically pros and cons of two different ways of doing task-based control. We, we started from discussing the limitations of joint space control, which is mainly unit a joint space trajectory, which is not often the case in practice. In practice, <laughs> in practice, you typically have a, a task space trajectory. So if you're controlling a manipulator, you typically have a, a desired motion for the end effect or not for the joints. So we would like a controller that can deal with that. And we have seen that there are two ways of dealing with that. Either you, you take the desired end effect or trajectory, you, you compute a joint space trajectory that corresponds to it, and then you do joint space control, as we had already seen. Or you try to modify the controller so that it can deal directly with a reference for the end effector. And that is what we have here in this slide. And that's uh, basically the approach that everybody uses in practice in, in robotics. The reason is that this allows you to, to have the, the reference specified online you don't need to know in advance the trajectory that you would like to follow. So you can do, for instance, visual tracking in case you want to grasp something, an object that is moving and you don't know in advance what the movement of the object will be. It allows you to specify gains, these PD gains, directly in the space of the end effector. So for instance, you can have a, a behavior that is more stiff in certain directions and more compliant in other directions because the gains are directly related to the stiffness of the of the behavior of the robot and the only disadvantage is that you have a controller that is slightly more complicated but if you compare this optimization problem with the one we had for joint space control well we have the same variables we have the same constraints the only thing that has changed is the cost function and it's not such a big change. I mean, we need to compute the Jacobian and the, this term Jacobian derivative times uh, joint velocities, but that's not a big deal. These are quantities that can be computed very easily with libraries as, such as Pinocchio and that take in the order of some microseconds to compute. So it's fine. So now that we have seen what the space control is and why it is a good thing. We are going to generalize what we have seen for uh, the, the specific case of end effector of a manipulator to the more general case of a uh, task. So, so far when I, when I was talking about task space control, I was always uh, referring to controlling the end effector position. That's what I always said. Uh, but in general, you may want to control other things that are not in the factor position. In a manipulator, you may want to control the position of the elbow, for instance. Or more realistically, when you're controlling more complicated systems such as humanoids or quadrupeds, then you have other quantities you want to control. The center of mass, for instance, is very important for locomotion and balancing. The angular momentum is, all, is also one that is very often controlled. Uh, the position of the, of the feet of the robot, the, the orientation of the head for deciding where the robot uh, should look. You see there are many other examples of quantities that are neither the position of the end effector or um, the joint space that you want to control. So let's try to generalize what we have seen for the end effector control to the general concept of task. And to do that, we will start by defining uh, different uh, task models and see how they can be integrated in the uh, TSID optimization problem. So first of all, what is a task? Well, when I say task, what I actually mean is a control objective. It is something that you would like the robot to do. Okay, 
And how do we define a task? Well, we define them using functions. And we will call these functions E, which are functions that we want to minimize. Okay. And without loss of generality, we will assume from now on that the functions E are actually measuring errors between the real value of a certain output function Y and the reference or desired value of that function. So I'm using Y for the output, similarly to control theory. So that should be a familiar notation. And E is just the difference between your output and what you would like your output to be at that point in time. Okay. And the output is not only a function of the state, but also a function of the control. So here we are reasoning about something that is very abstract. But again, you can think of this Y as, for instance, the center of mass of your robot, the angular momentum of your robot, the orientation of the head or the camera, let's say, of your robot. Or it can also be the, the joint state of your robot or the position of the end effects or of your, of your manipulator. It can be basically anything you want, any function of X and, and U. Okay. So here you, you may see some similarities between this and optimal control, but I want to point out one crucial difference that in optimal control, the function that you minimize depends on the whole trajectory of state and control. Okay, so it's typically an integral over time of some function of state and control. Here, that's not the case. Here, Y only depends on the instantaneous, on the current value of X and U. There is no horizon. It's an instantaneous controller. It's a reactive controller. Okay, that's the crucial difference between this and optimal control. Actually, you can think of this as optimal control, but when your horizon is as a zero length, okay? If your horizon collapses to zero, then you get this. Actually, there are also a couple of papers that try to, to prove this more formally. In case you're interested, you can ask me. So what's inside this mysterious function E? Well, the idea is that we want to, to have E expressed such that it is affine in the variables of, of the optimization problem that we, we solve. And the variables, if you remember, were the joint accelerations, V dot, and the, the joint torques, tau, which here I, I'm calling new because it's generic control inputs. And that is fine if your, your function is a function of the of the control inputs because you can say okay I have an affine function of my control input that I want to to minimize and that's typically okay but when it comes to function of the state then they are not they cannot be linearly dependent on v dots and u because they depend on on x and x basically is the state of the system which which are the joint angles and the joint velocities and those are not variables of my optimization problems, right? The variables of my optimization problems are the accelerations and the torques, not the position and the velocities. Position and velocities for my optimization problems, they are constant because I measure the state and that, that's the state. I cannot change it right now. I can change it in the future, but not in the present. Okay, so how do we deal with uh, task functions that depends on position and velocities. Well, we apply a very simple trick. Since we cannot change E instantaneously, because it depends on quantities that cannot change instantaneously, we will, instead of trying to, mean to impose E, we will try to impose the dynamics of E. Okay, so either the first derivative or the second derivative <coughs> of E, depending on whether E is a function of Q or V. If it's a function of V, just by taking the first derivative, we get V dot. If it's a function of Q, we need to derive it twice to get V dot. So we try to impose 
the dynamics of E such that E will converge to zero. That's the trick. Ciao. Ciao. And of course, we need to get uh, e, e dot as an affine function of, of v dot or u. Well, in practice, it will be v dot. Because so we can put it inside our least square program, maintaining all the constraints <coughs> linear and all the cost function quadratic. So maybe this is a bit abstract, so let me give you a, an example of how we're going to do that. Let's consider a, a task function e which depends on the joint velocities. So we have E, which depends on V and T, which is actually just the difference between some function of the velocities. Let's say it's the angular momentum of the robot and the, the reference value for that function, which could also be zero for the angular momentum. That's something we, we do very often. So since we cannot impose E because it depends on velocities, we will impose its time derivative. And let's say we want to impose a, a linear dynamics for, for E. So E dot equal minus KE. Why is that a good choice? K is positive, so this goes, goes to zero. This is a stable linear system. E dot equal minus KE. This is exponentially decaying to zero. So if we manage to impose E dot to be equal to minus KE, then we know that E is going to converge to zero, which is where we want it to be, because E is an error. So if the error is zero, we are happy. Now, is, now the question is, can we represent E dot as a linear function of my problem variables, which are the joint accelerations, basically? And the answer is yes. How? Well, E dot is actually Y dot minus Y dot star and Y dot using the chain rule as we, we showed also last time. I can write it as the gradient, the Jacobian of Y with respect to V, joint velocities, times the derivative of V with respect to time. So V dot, joint accelerations. Okay. So I... I call this Jacobian J and I move this on the other side and I get J V dot equals uh, Y dot star minus K E and this is, a, is an affine function of the problem variables which are V dot okay uh, a little side note, we decided to, to impose linear dynamics, but actually that's not necessary. I mean, the function that we use to compute A can be nonlinear. This doesn't affect the problem. As long as what we have here is linear in V dot, we are good. But this can be nonlinear in, in the state of the system because the state is known, so we don't care. So in practice, most of the time people just impose linear dynamics for the for the task function, but you could also impose nonlinear dynamics if you wanted to. Uh, one specific case of nonlinearity that sometimes is introduced is saturation. Because if your if your error for some reason and gets very large, then you, you might get a very large value of E dot. So you may want to saturate this function to certain bounds. So sometimes people do that. But apart from that, typically we always use linear, linear dynamics. It's just a side note. So let's see the same trick now applied to the case where your task function depends on positions not velocities. It's very similar. We just need to derive twice instead of deriving once, but it's the same principle. So we start from the function E, which depends on Q and T, which is actually the, an output 
function depending on q, for instance, center of mass position, minus a, a reference value for the center of mass position. This is actually what we're going to see in the example later in the first script. We're going to track a desired center of mass position for the robot. So this time, if we want to get to the acceleration level, since we start from positions, we need to take the derivative twice. And we are going to impose a second order linear dynamics. Again, as long as k and d are, are positive definite matrices, this dynamics converges to zero. Okay. And if you choose k and d appropriately, you're going to get a, a nice convergence without overshooting and oscillations. So we double dot, we can express it as a linear function of my problem variables, which are the accelerations, v dot. You get j v dot plus j dot v. This is, this is the same math that I wrote last time to the, to the whiteboard. Do you want me to, to rewrite it? If you don't say no, I will do it. <laughs> do you want me to rewrite it? Okay. So we have E which is equal Y minus Y star. And now we want to impose E double dot equal minus K E minus D E dot. So E double dot is actually Y double dot minus y double dot star okay now y is a function of q I mean, I didn't write it but it's a function of q so I can write it as let me do it here so let's say y dot of q I can write it as the gradient, the decoding of y with respect to q times q dot. And so let's call this decoding j, j q dot, which is actually b. And so y double dot, which is the derivative of this, is the first time the derivative of the second plus the derivative of the first time the second okay so i can substitute this in here and i get j v dot plus j dot v equal y double dot star minus k e minus d dot which is basically what we have here so we see we have an affine function of v dot affine because we have a linear term and here we have a an offset a bias Actually, here, here it's written not as a function, here it's written as a equality. But you can imagine that if you, if you move everything on one side, you have a function of v dot equal to zero. And what we're going to do in practice, uh, what I'm anticipating the, the next slide, what we're going to do in practice, um, it's, it's even in the next one uh, is that we are gonna minimize we're gonna minimize the norm of this function so ideally we would like this equality to hold right so we would like this to be equal to this but in general it may not be possible so what we are gonna do is that we're gonna write this as, as g of v dot which is equal to j v dot plus j dot v minus y double dot star plus k e plus d 
p dot. Mm -hmm. So ideally, we want this to be equal to zero, but putting that as a constraint in the problem might be a bit too optimistic because it may not be possible to do that. So what we do instead is that we're going to, to minimize the norm of, of g of v dot. Okay. That's why I call this a function and not a equality. It's because we're going to use it inside the closed function, not as a, as a constraint in the problem. And of course, in case it's, it's possible to get this equality to hold, well, then the minimum of a norm is zero, and this is zero when this equality holds. So when it's possible, it's going to be equivalent. But at least this doesn't make your problem unfeasible in case it's not possible to satisfy the equality. So let, let's quickly summarize what we have seen so far today. For the task function, we have basically three different cases. We have the functions of the control inputs, u, which must be affine. There is no way out of that. If they are affine, well, the control inputs are a variable of our problem, so we can put them either as constraints or as cost functions to minimize. Instead, when we have functions of the state, <coughs> then it's a bit trickier because the state is not a variable of, of our problem, but we can impose the dynamics of this function, first or second time derivative. And so we get a function that is affine in, in V dot in that case. So regardless of which of the three functions we, we have in the beginning. In the end, we have an affine function of our problem variables, which are accelerations and control inputs. So from now on, we will be talking about this generic case of uh, capital A times Y minus A, which is what we want to minimize. Okay, And we know that inside this, we might have functions of, of the state or of the control and we know how we can manipulate them to get them in into this shape is that clear okay so let's see now how we how we use them in the optimization problem so the idea is that we the problem has always the same form. We have the same variables, v dot and, and tau. We have the same constraints, which are the dynamics of the system. Here it is, it is written for the case of an underactuated system. So instead of having the identity matrix here multiplying the joint torques, we have the, the selection matrix. But it's not a big difference. I mean, in case you're controlling a manipulator, we, you know that S is the identity. It's just a special case. And here, instead of having, uh, for instance, the, the, the joint acceleration tracking error, as we had in joint space control, we have this abstract generic fu linear function, a y minus a. OK? So we're going to work with that for a while. Let's now try to, to extend this to the case where the system is in contact. Because we have talked about systems in contact in the first lesson when talking about modeling, but then we have put that aside so far, right? When, when we started talking about control, we have only so far dealt with systems that are not in contact. But since, uh, I mean, the final goal of this class is to talk about locomotion, then contact plays a, a crucial role in that. So we need to deal with that. So, first thing that we already said when talking about modeling is that when your system is in contact, you need to account for the contact forces. That's the number one thing you need to do, regardless of which contact you have. So, let's talk about soft contacts first, because they are easier. If the contact is, is soft, 
then what you what you can do is that you can estimate the contact forces maybe you have a, a, a force torque sensor at the end detector of your rubber so you can measure the interaction force directly you have your estimation and the only change you need to apply to your control problem is that in the dynamics of the system you, you add the force as J transpose F estimated okay but apart from that the problem doesn't change it's the same problem as before you just basically updated the dynamics and you need to somehow estimate the contact forces otherwise you don't know enough information about how your system is going to evolve through time so that's very simple but that's not what we're going to do because we're not going to work with soft contacts we're going to work with rigid contacts because for locomotion that's typically the case I mean not only for locomotion also for many cases of manipulation everybody I mean the assumption of rigid contact is, is much more common in practice for control than the one of soft contacts okay so of course one could say well soft rigid it's not so clear on which side I should stay because you can always say my contact is soft but my stiffness is one million newton per meters which is quite rigid right and then the two models should behave almost the same the problem is that if you use the soft contact model but with a very high stiffness values it becomes numerically unstable that's why people tend to use the rigid contact assumption because the soft contact assumption works well numerically speaking only if the contact is quite soft so if you have a sponge then it's reasonable to go for the soft version of the contest but if you have wood which is not super rigid you should still model it as rigid probably okay so let's focus now on the on the rigid contact case we already mentioned when we talked about modeling that the key difference between soft and rigid contact is that rigid contact constrain the motion so you remember the example once you are in contact with the wall no matter how hard i push i cannot move in that direction okay so i have a, a constraint and the constraint is uh, given in that form c of q equal to constant where c of q is a function giving me the contact point as a function of the of the robot configuration q but since our problem is is working at the level of accelerations we cannot add that constraint into our problem directly so what we do is that we take the derivative of that constraint twice so we get jv equals zero where j in this case is the jacobian of this function with respect to q jv dot plus j dot v equals zero so this means that the contact point velocities are, are null and this means that the accelerations are null and if we know that at, at time zero when we start having the constraint this and this are satisfied then only imposing this is enough to guarantee also this and this right we went through this when we did modeling so if you if you start in the right position with zero velocity and you maintain zero acceleration then the velocity is going to stay zero and if the velocity is going to stay zero your contact point is going to stay where it was so in the right position that's why it's enough to to impose this it's because we are implicitly assuming that when we start imposing this these two guys are already satisfied okay so we have this rigid contact constraint now and what we need to do is that we need to add them to the dynamics of my system so now my system dynamics will have an additional row this one here which is just j times v dot which is the first variable inside y equal minus j dot v and the the other crucial difference with respect to the soft contact case 
apart from having these constraints, is that here f became a variable of the problem. So I don't need to estimate my contact forces as for the soft contact case. The reason why is a bit maybe difficult to see for you right now because I didn't explain it. The reason is that when you have a rigid contact, the contact force directly depends on your joint torques, on your control inputs. So if I, if I, how do I, okay, let's assume I'm, I'm like this, okay. I'm exactly parallel to the wall. And I have one actuator, which is this joint here. So I get in contact. Now I'm in rigid contact with the wall. What happens if I apply zero torque at my joint? How much is the contact force? Shift. Zero. And if I apply one, one newton meter, and I have a lever arm of, of one meter, I get one newton, right? So you see that the contact force directly depends on your control inputs. It's not something that you can measure because it, it depends on what you're going to do. So it's a problem, it's a variable. If instead the, the contact was soft, then my contact force would depend on the, on the penetration of the contact point into the wall. And that is a function of the state, Q and V. It's not a function of the control input. So in that case, I need to, to, to estimate it and, and feed, feed it back in the controller. So you see, it's, it's a very different model that you get when you switch from soft to rigid. Even if by increasing the stiffness, you can make the soft behave as if it was rigid, but from the control perspective, it really changes completely the way you, you, you write down your optimization problems. So F now is a variable of my problem. And from now on, we're, we're always gonna have V dot, F and tau as problem variables, okay? And of course, it also appears inside the dynamics because here we have N times V dot minus J transpose times F minus S transpose times tau equal minus h. So that's the usual dynamics of the robot in contact mm -hmm. that we saw in the first lesson. Okay, so this is task space inverse dynamics for robots in rigid contact. This is as hard as it gets. So that's a problem we're going to work with for, for the rest of the day, maybe also for for the next lesson on Monday a little bit. We're not gonna add anything complex to that. Just we're gonna tweak a, tweak a little, talk a bit more about what's inside the cost function. But that's the problem that we need to use for making the, the humanoid robot work, basically. And as we already discussed for uh, the manipulator, what is the main benefit of, of formulating everything as an optimization problem? Well, that you can add inequality constraints. So what kind of inequality constraints can we add? Well, anything that is affine in my problem variables. So joint torques, contact forces, and uh, accelerations. So as for the case of the manipulator, I can have joint torque bounds, but since now I also have the contact forces inside the problem variables, I can also model uh, friction cones. So I can say that my contact forces should stay inside the friction cone. This is crucial because this basically tells the, the optimizer that when I'm in contact with the wall, first thing, I can only push, I cannot pull. Because if I pull, my contact force would be outside the friction cone because my, my, my normal force would be negative but it can only be positive and then it also tells the optimizer that the tangential force that can be applied is limited 
and it's a function of the normal force okay and it goes constrained to stay inside the friction cone of course i need to know the friction coefficient to say the angle of the friction cone um, you may wonder well but friction cones are, are quadratic right because they are they are they have a conic shape and, and here I, I can only specify linear inequalities yes it's true so what we do in practice is that if you if you look at so this is a, a friction cone seen from the side okay and it's, it's round so if you look at it from above you take a section you get a, a circle so what we do in practice is that we linearize the friction cone is something like that so you, you, you represent each friction cone with four linear inequalities and you get a conservative approximation of course if you really want you can also use eight inequalities and you get a, a better approximation at the price of having more inequality constraints in your problem which is not a big deal in practice but it's just that typically it's not really needed uh, so people stick with four side uh, approximation most of the time then of course we can also have uh, joint acceleration velocity or even position bounds expressed as a function of the acceleration we could also go for fancier things such as collision avoidance constraints to to avoid uh, basically collision with the environment or even self-collision uh, but that's a bit more complicated so i'm not going to talk about that just you should know that it's possible it doesn't work super well you have no theoretical guarantee that it's going to work but it's something that people sometimes use and it kind of work okay so that's uh, basically the, the, the advantage of having an optimization solver instead of computing everything by yourself it's mainly summarized by by these four points in my opinion in practice what we're gonna use in the in the scripts you're gonna have the force friction cones because those are the most important ones you don't want your robot to start pulling on the ground when it walks because that's not physically consistent and we're gonna have work well we have already seen the joint torque bounds and the joint velocity bounds last time no, only the velocity bounds. Well, we're going to see also the giant torque bounds uh, in, a while, in a little while. So, so far, we have talked about first joint space control, then task space control, but we have always focused on the case where we have one control objective. So, either controlling the joints or controlling a given task function such as center of mass or angular momentum but in practice when you have a, a complex system with many degrees of freedom you typically don't have only one thing you would like to do for instance for walking sure the center of mass is crucial for balancing and stability but you also need to to care about uh, the trajectory of your, of your foot because if your foot don't doesn't step where it's supposed to be well you're gonna fall and at the same time while you walk you may want to look at a certain part of the scene because there is a target that you want to to reach so you may be controlling the center of mass while controlling the feet while also controlling the orientation of the head so in general we are going to deal with uh, multitask control because we have several objectives so how do we put them together in the optimization problems that we have seen and there are uh, two different ways of doing that the first approach is the so-called weighted approach so you have uh, let's say n different tasks 
each task is defined by a function gi with i going from 1 to n they are all least square functions as we have seen so far and instead of minimizing only one of them we sum them together using some user-defined weights w and the sum of least square functions is again a least square function which is very good because it means that the, the kind of problem that we need to solve is the same it remains a least square pro program it doesn't change basically and also the computational complexity of the problem is basically the same because we have the same number of variables and the same number of constraints and that's what really defines the complexity of, of, your, of your problem if your cost function is just a, a, an affine function or it is the sum of n affine functions that doesn't affect the complexity of your problem at all okay so that's the main pro of, of this approach the cons is that um, finding this weight that basically define how much you care about one specific task with respect to the others may be a bit tricky especially if you have many tasks you want to achieve if you have two tasks or three tasks it's not a problem because typically you know quite well how much you care about one task with respect to the other for instance if you were controlling a humanoid robot walking center of mass it's super important foot position super important as well what about the head orientation eh, not so important right so you would assign maybe a weight of 1000 to the center of mass the same for the foot position but then for the head orientation maybe you assign a weight of one and then you might have some other term like for controlling the to, to keep the, the the chest of the robot upright because you don't want the robot to, to walk like that you want it to, to walk like that that's it's nice but it's not as important as the center of mass and the foot trajectory because those are really affecting the stability of the system so you may assign a, a weight of 10 and you can work it out like that and typically it works you don't need to fine-tune all these parameters very much as long as you don't have too many tasks but if you start having like five or six tasks and the, the, the relative importance of the task is quite different then you might need to have a, a, a weight that is very small for the tasks that are less important and a weight that is very high for the tasks that are more important and this can lead to numerical issues because when you start having very small number <coughs> summed to very high numbers well that's where computers start having problems and numerical solvers as well yeah based on your experience what the order of magnitude <coughs> do you suggest for so I, let's say that the ratio between the highest and the smallest should be at most one million yeah as long as you stay no it's not so small it's not so small but if you want to have really say a, a guarantee that a task that is less important is not affecting a task that is more important you need already 1000 of ratio okay so if you have three levels let's say it's fine because you can do one 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 thousand and one million that's fine but then if you want to add uh, a fourth le level then it's not going to work if you do it this, this way you're going to have numerical problems so that's the problem of this approach that you need to, to tune these weights by hand and this may lead to, to numerical issues especially if you don't have experience with that uh, it happens sometimes that you have two important tasks, but uh, they are one against the uh, other, and then it's not possible to pursue them. For example, a position of the feet and uh, the position of the center of the mass, and you cannot achieve both, both at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, it happens. 
Yeah, it happens. I mean, the, the whole point of this framework is that you can actually have at the same time, time tasks that are incompatible between them. And by tuning the weights, you can basically tell the optimizer in case these two are not compatible, you should give priority to this. So if all the tasks were compatible, actually the weights are not, were not, wouldn't be important. You could just assign a weight of one to everything. They would all be compatible with one another and no problem whatsoever. The weights start being important only when you have conflicts between the tasks. But that's typically the case in practice. So one very common way of using this framework is that you have your center of mass, your feet, and whatever. And then you also have a, a joint posture of task. So you specify a desired position for all the joints, which is typically static. And that's obviously in conflict with all the other tasks, because the other tasks instead are requiring some motion. But since the joint posture task has a weight that is much lower, that doesn't affect the, the tasks that are more important. I mean, it affects it, but to a very small degree, so you don't even see it in practice. Okay. So you can have task conflicts. You, you do have it most of the time. And it's thanks to the weight that the optimizer can know how to deal with, with the conflicts in, in the way that you, that you desire. OK, so that's the first way of doing it. There is, by the way, that's the way we're going to use in the scripts. And that's the only way uh, the only approach that is implemented in the library TSID at the moment. There is a second way, which is a bit more complicated, which is to use hierarchical optimization. So instead of having weights, you have priority levels. So you define a an order uh, between the tasks. You say uh, task one, is more important than task two, task two is more important than task three, and so on, up to task n. And then instead of solving one, only one D square program, you solve a sequence of program, one for each task, starting from the first one. So the first one is a classical uh, optimization problem, just minimize the cost function associated to the task subject to the dynamics, you got your solution, but then you don't stop there. You solve a second optimization problem where you minimize the second cost function, but you add a constraint that the cost function of the task that was more important shouldn't change. It should remain at, at, at its optimum. So G star is the optimum value of the cost function and you iterate like that for each task. So basically what you're saying is, is that the, the second task, cause function, should be minimized in the null space of the first task, cause function, okay? So you can do this using null space projection techniques. I don't know if you've seen them in linear algebra or in control theory classes. Or you can do them just by simply adding uh, constraints to your optimization problem. There are different numerical ways of, of doing that. But in the end, the problem you're solving is equivalent to this. So in this way, you can be sure that if task two is never going to affect the performance of task one. So task one is going to be performed at the best possible by the system. And task three is never going to affect task two or task one, and so on. Okay, you have a strict priority. It's a hierarchy. You don't have weights. So weights are are called sometimes soft priorities, whereas these are called hard priorities. So pros and cons. The advantage is that it's easier to find priorities than to find weights because you can have a continuous value to tune. You have a, a finest number of choices. It's a discrete choice. 
either one is more important than two or two is more important than one. Uh, the disadvantage is that here you're not solving one problem, you're solving one for each task. So if you have five tasks, you need to solve five problems. But the size of each problem is less than... If you do things properly, using um, no space projection techniques, then the size of each problem is decreasing basically. So it's not like if you have five tasks, it's gonna be five times longer to compute, but it's still gonna be longer. Unless you use some very specific solver, which in theory should be faster, but in practice, I mean, it has been shown that it, it is faster, but the problem is that these kind of solvers that are specifically done for hierarchical optimization are still not mature software. So they are research software written by researchers for publishing papers, but they haven't been engineered to the level that everybody can use them. So probably the person who wrote the software can use it, maybe a couple of friends around him, and that's it. <laughs> If you're further than 10 meters away from this researcher, you cannot use it. That's how it works. So we are not going to use this approach, but it is, it is very well known in our community. There has been a lot of work on, on these kind of approaches. I also did my PhD thesis working a lot on, on this approach. So I just wanted to mention it. So let's finish this set of slides by talking a little bit about computational aspects and then we take a break. Why computational aspects? Well, because once again, we are solving uh, optimization problems inside very fast control loop. Typically we aim for one kilohertz control loop. So we need to solve this problem fast. We have one millisecond, actually less because apart from solving the problem, there are also about a few other things we need to do like reading the sensors, sending the motor commands, maybe do a little bit of estimation. So hopefully we should maybe solve it in half a millisecond. <clears throat> and what's the size of this problem? Let's take the, the, the worst case, which is uh, the humanoid. Humanoid, you have about, mm, I don't know which number I was considering here, probably 30 degrees of freedom. That's the number of uh, joint velocities, accelerations actually, and then you have 30 motors, more or less, one for each joint, and then you have, let's say, 10 force variables, roughly, so it's roughly 70 variables for your problem. Then the quality constraints, you have uh, the same number of uh, joint accelerations plus the number of contact forces as a quality constraint, that's the size of the constraints. So we, it would be about 40 for a humanoid. And then you have uh, inequality constraints for the joint accelerations, for the joint torques, and for the, for the friction cone constraints. Here is a, assuming that the friction cones are approximated with four-sided pyramids as I draw there. So it's a pretty big problem, 70 variables, 40 equality, and more than 40 inequalities. So can we solve it in half a millisecond? Well, the, the crucial part to keep in mind is that uh, the computational cost for solving a, a, a least square program, or a QP, quadratic program, is dominated by the decomposition of the Hessian of the cost function. Okay, what's the Hessian of the cost function? Well, we have least squares cost function, which look like this. The cost function was a y minus a squared, right? So actually we solve it as a QP, so we need to express this as a quadratic function which is y transpose a transpose a y 
minus 2 a transpose a y plus a transpose a. It is actually we don't care because it's constant, so it doesn't affect uh, the value, uh, it doesn't affect the, the optimal solution. So a QP solver typically has this wants a, a cost function under this shape, where this is the Hessian, this is called Hessian, and it is called gradient. Okay, so our Hessian is A transpose A, right? And this matrix here, typically to solve the QP needs to be decomposed. The numerical decomposition that is used in many cases is the Cholewski decomposition, which is one of the fastest to compute, but still its computational complexity scales with the cube of the number of variables. What does it mean? It means that if you, if you take a problem with twice as many variables, you can expect the computation time to be eight times longer, not twice longer. That's what it means to scale with a cube. But yeah, uh, you're assuming an active set uh, solution method for the QP or an, an integral point? And this holds also for the integral point, this, this reasoning? Or? So, Michele is referring to the fact that there are two kinds of uh, methods for solving quadratic programs, um, which basically use different strategies for dealing with the inequality constraints. One family of methods is called active set methods, and the other one is interior point methods. So the one that we are using inside the library is an active set method. And what I'm talking about mainly refers to active set methods. But I think that these specific considerations also hold for interior point methods. So you always need to decompose the hashing of the problem. So the, and, and the, in general, the complexity of any optimization problem, as long as it is not sparse, scales with the cube of the number of variables. No, the, the number of constraints doesn't, doesn't matter? The it matters in practice, but in terms of computational complexity analysis, uh, the scaling goes with the number the dominant factor is always this okay. for, for the theoretical analysis. And for, for QPs, uh, also in practice, I've measured the computation times, and the, the part of the code that takes the longest to execute is indeed the Hessian decomposition. So let's say the difference between the unconstrained problem and the constraint problem, it's, it's, uh, it's not that big. Yeah. yeah. Is, You were saying something? the number of constraints run like uh, n cube or, or something less than than uh, than uh, n power of three. So the the the, um, the computational cost for for constraints are less than. This yeah. Case. Yeah. I mean, of course, there are like corner cases where the solver needs to to work a lot, let's say, to make sure that the constraints are satisfied, especially inequality constraints. Uh, and so it may take much longer to solve the problem with the inequality constraints than, than without. But in the large majority, like 99.99% .99 of the cases, solving it with or without the constraints, the condition time is almost the same, okay? Because actually what an active set solver does inside is to guess which inequality constraints are going to be active, which means satisfied at the, at the equality with zero margin. And then these constraints are, are um, considered as equality and the others are disregarded. So inside it's just solving a problem with only equality constraints. Mm 
and the one with the quality constraints again can be transformed into a problem without even the quality constraint. So at the core of the solver, you have the solution of the problem without the constraints. And that's uh, what takes uh, most of the time in terms of computation. So yeah, what we need to keep in mind is that we are solving a problem with 70 variables and uh, the complexity scales with the cube of the variable. So if we manage to reduce the number of variables, we can expect the, the problem to be much faster to solve. That's the key message here. And 70, it starts being quite large. This should be within, there is a spelling mistake. So 70 is a bit large. So it's not so sure that we can solve it in, in one millisecond. Of course, it depends on the machine on which you're solving it. So it, ideally, it, it would be better to reduce the size of the problem. How can we do it? Well, we can exploit the structure of the equality constraints of the problem to basically remove a part of the variables and so make it much faster to solve. And the trick is very simple. So if you, the, the equality constraints of the problem are actually the dynamics of the robot, okay? So the first line, we have the relief contact constraints, which say uh, the contact point accelerations are zero, jv dot equal minus j dot v. And then we have the dynamics of the system, which here I, I decomposed into two uh, blocks. The first line is the dynamics of the, of the base of the robot, which is passive. So we have zero corresponding to the joint torques because the joint torques are not pushing the base, they are only applying a torque to the joints. That's what we saw in the first lesson, that we can decompose the dynamics into passive dynamics and, and actuated dynamics, where the actuated dynamics is the same one of a manipulator, and the passive dynamics doesn't depend on the joint torques. Okay. So here I'm, I'm explicitly showing this. Why am I doing that? Because I want to point out that here we have an identity matrix on the diagonal of this uh, matrix. So what does it mean when you have an identity matrix on the diagonal of your equality constraint? Well, it means that you can very easily express the corresponding variable, which are the joint torques, as a function of the other variables of the problem because the identity matrix is very easy to invert. The inverse of the identity is the identity. So we can exploit this by expressing the joint torques as a linear function of the other variables. This is nothing complicated. Basically, here I just I'm just writing the dynamics of my system. I say that my joint torques are equal to the mass matrix times the joint acceleration minus Jacobian transpose times contact forces plus bias forces. It's just the dynamics. And here, basically, what I want you to look at is I can express Y, which are all my problem variables, in terms of a smaller vector, Y bar, which only contains acceleration and forces, but not joint torques, okay? And to compute this matrix, I don't need to do any matrix inversion. Because if I had to invert something, then I would go back to the cubic complexity because to invert something, I need to do matrix decomposition and that's complex. But for this specific case of Tau, since we have an identity matrix here, I don't need to invert anything. And so I can re-express my problem instead of being in terms of Y, I can re-express it in terms of Y bar, which is much smaller. Basically, for a humanoid, I just removed 30 variables. So yeah, I almost halved the size of my variable vector. Which, is, which means that the problem is going to be eight times faster to solve. 
So let's see how it looks like. I have y equals d y bar plus d. So if this was my original problem, I just substitute y with that expression and I get this as my new problem. So instead of y, I have capital D y bar plus d in the equals function and in the constraints. And then here for the dynamic constraints, the last row basically disappeared because when I substitute, I get zero equals zero. So it's not a constraint that is worth taking into account. So not only I removed 30 variables, I also removed 30 constraints. Okay. So I get a problem that is smaller and basically for free because I don't need to do any complex operation to do this transformation. And this is how it is implemented inside the library. So in theory, there are tricks that can be used to improve even more. Um, I'm not going to discuss them, but the take on message is that in my opinion, the other tricks are not really worth it because either they're going to limit the expressiveness of the problem or they're going to make your, your software more complex for a very little gain, like maybe a few percentages of computation time. So it's not really interesting. Okay, I think that's enough. Let's take a break here, 10 minutes, and then we, we finish the slides later. <laughs>